Well, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in lots of different scriptures this morning, but uh, just to get a head start on that, we got uh, Numbers chapter 6 and Luke chapter 2. Numbers chapter 6 and Luke chapter 2, and as we've been going through this Advent season, remember Advent is that word that simply means coming. We're talking about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ into our world to save us. And we've been lighting the Advent candles, and each candle has a uh, particular meaning. The first candle was uh, Christ our hope, that there is no other hope, right? He is the hope of the world. And we lit the next candle, the Christ the way, that Jesus is the only way to God the Father, the only way to salvation and eternal life. There's no other path you can take. And then last week we lit the third candle, Christ our joy. Hmm. Joy, true, abiding, sustaining joy is only through Jesus Christ. Happiness comes and goes, but joy lasts now and forever in Jesus. And then today we're going to look at Christ, our peace. Christ, our peace. And then tomorrow, Christmas Eve, which is still hard to believe it's Christmas Eve tomorrow, will be our candlelight service at 5 o'clock. Um, <clears throat> bring friends, bring family, and we're going to look at Christ, the love of God. Hmm. So looking forward to that. Uh, remember also during our Advent season messages, we have our phrase of praise. Blessed be Jesus. <laughs> so when I say blessed be Jesus, that's the cue for everybody to respond to God in praise with blessed be Jesus, right? A little, a little shout up to heaven and say, Lord, you're wonderful. We love you. We adore you. You are all things that we need. Hmm. So we'll, I'll, I'll surprise you with that now and then, and we'll continue with our phrase of praise during this time. Now, our little outline for this morning is very similar to last week. We're going to look at where does peace come from. We're going to look at types of peace, hindrances to peace, and peace with other people, and eternal peace. Very similar to last week when we looked at joy. Now it's, it's peace today. So first, to start with, where does peace come from? Right? Where, where, where do you get it? Can you buy it this, at the store at Christmas or what? I mean, where, do you, where does this stuff come from? <laughs> where does peace come from? Well, let me read to you from Numbers chapter 6. Uh, maybe you turn there. Numbers chapter 6, starting at verse uh, 23. This is a, uh, the high priestly blessing that God gave to Moses, and he gave it to the high priest. The first high priest, his name was Aaron, Mer- uh, Moses' brother. And he was blessing the people of Israel with this blessing, uh, putting God's name upon the people. And this is the blessing. Verse 24 says, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. So they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. Okay, so this is the high priestly prayer. Notice he wants to give his people peace, right? He wants to give his people peace. Now, uh, when I bless you at the end of our services, which is my normal uh, way of doing things, I bless you in the name of Jesus Christ, right? And then I bless you with whatever it is we learn in that morning through the passage of Scripture. But all I'm really trying to do is, is kind of recreate a slightly different version of what God gave Moses to give Aaron. And uh, so God has always desired to bless his people. Now, just a little side note, too. This is really cool because in Luke chapter 24, when Jesus was ascending into heaven, he raised his hands and it says he blessed them as he ascended into heaven. But this was the blessing that he gave them because Jesus is the great high priest. So he would have said, the Lord bless you and keep you as he's going off into heaven. He would have said, the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. So probably the very last words of Jesus as he was leaving the earth, ascending to the right hand of the Father interceding for us today. Hmm. So pretty cool. So God's plan has always been to bless his people. Verse 24, the Lord bless you and keep you. He wants to keep us with God, close to him, and wants to sustain us and take care of us. The Lord make his face shine upon you, verse 25, and be gracious to you. Well, if God's face is shining upon you, I think that's about relationship and a knowledge of, of God as he is being gracious to us. He's showing us his favor, though we do not deserve it. Verse 26, the Lord turn his face towards you and give you 
What? Peace. Peace. God has always wanted to bless his people with peace. He doesn't want his people running around all frazzled (laughs) and all stressed. He wants us to live in peace because he is our God, because he is our king. That's always been his original plan to bless his people with peace. Okay, so where does peace come from? Peace comes from God as he gives it as his wonderful blessing. So peace then does not come from circumstances. You can have some circumstances that seem to be peaceful, but notice how they come and go, though. We talked about a little bit of that last week. One day, oh, it's a really great day. It was great. <laughs> and the next day, it was, like, it was a horrible, horrible day, right? I have no peace. No, 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 no. Peace is way better than that because peace is constant because it comes from God and cannot be taken away. So it doesn't come from our circumstances. Peace does not come from money. <laughs> Though when the bank account's full, it's like, ooh, that's kind of nice, right? But that's ultimately not where peace comes from because some people have very full bank accounts and they have no peace. So <laughs> the people who win the lottery, they often say, that's the worst thing that ever happened to me. Right? Peace does not come from possessions. It does not come from other people. But true peace only comes from God through Jesus Christ. And the world wants peace. The world's been talking about peace. I wasn't born in the 60s, I was born in the 70s, but in the 60s, I've listened to a lot of that music, and they're always talking about peace, aren't they? They're singing about peace, and all the little hippies all came out, and it's all peace, brother, and all this kind of stuff, right? The bumper stickers that say, world peace. Has that happened yet? I know. There's wars and rumors of wars all the time. (laughs) And the Bible says that's going to happen until the day Jesus returns. And people are trying to find that inner peace, but, you know, you can smoke all the pot you want. You're still not going to get inner peace, right? Maybe for a couple of moments you think you feel all right, but then you come out of it and life is still life. So the hippies couldn't get it right either. Right? We're still trying today, though. People want that inner peace. The world gives peace, sure. But it's counterfeit. It only lasts for a moment and then it's gone. And then you wake up in the morning with your hangover. Right? So Merry Christmas, everyone. Christmas is all about God so loving the world that he gave the Prince of Peace to us. He took peace out of heaven and brought him to earth so that we might know him and experience him and live inside peace. Isaiah chapter 9, it was just read up here earlier, For unto us a son is given, to unto us a child is born, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, right? Mm. So the Prince of Heaven came to earth mm, to bring us peace. Okay, so peace comes from God. So that leads us to our next passage, Luke chapter 2. God has always wanted to bless his people with peace. So he took peace from heaven and brought him to earth in the person of Christ. And we'll read the birth, part of the birth narrative there in Luke chapter 2 of peace coming to earth in the person of Jesus. We've read through this passage already during Advent. We're going to read just a little bit further into Luke chapter 2. And tomorrow we'll read even a little further uh, into that passage. So Luke chapter 2, the sending of peace into our world. In a wonderful way, a wonderful way. Luke 2, let's go to verse 4, Luke 2, 4. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. And he went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her son, uh, gave birth to her firstborn, a son, And she wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And I always think, let's not think of ourselves too high and mighty when our king, the Savior, was born in a stable and his first bed was in a feeding trough, right? (laughs) Let's be humble. He came so humbly. Verse 8, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. 
But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy. That was our passage or one of our passages from last week. Christ our joy. There will be for all the people today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You'll find a baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. Peace to men. There's our passage for this morning. So those poor little shepherds, they're out there scared to death. The angels are appearing to them in this huge company of hosts and they're singing and they're shouting glory to God in the highest and peace to to men on whom his favor rests. So just as Jesus came into the world, the pronouncement of joy joy was with him, so also the pronouncement of peace has come because the Prince of Peace has entered our world. Hmm. And it says, on whom his favor rests. When Jesus came, the door of God's favor and grace opened and said, come to me. Come to me and be saved. Trust in my son Jesus. So we live today in the day of God's favor. His favor is resting upon mankind. Today is the day of salvation. Now we can be saved. But one day that door will close. But now it's open okay, because of Jesus. So peace is now available for everybody who trusts in Jesus. Hmm. And submits unto the lordship of Christ. Very important. So peace is not a feeling, though we can feel peaceful, sure. Peace is not an idea. Peace is not a state of mind. Peace is a person. And his name is Jesus. Because our world will say other things. You know, the Buddhists and all, they're trying to find nirvana and peace and all, they're meditating and they're going home home and they're trying to become one with the universe. Whatever they're doing, right? They think it's a state of mind. It's not a state of mind. (laughs) They'll never find it. It's not an idea, and it's not even a feeling, though we can feel it, certainly, when we come into the presence of Jesus. But peace is a person. The greatest gift from God. We think of Christmas gifts, well, God gave a gift. The greatest of them all. For unto us the Son is given. The Prince of Peace. Blessed be Jesus. Let me take you over to John chapter 16. John 16, down in verse 33. Jesus has spent these several chapters talking to his disciples, and they're worried and they're stressed, and they're not doing well. John 16, 33, Jesus said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So where do we find peace? In the person of Jesus. In me, he says, you'll find peace. Not in some special thing you're going to go do. and No, but in the person of Jesus is where we find peace. And it's interesting because sometimes, and maybe you've been there, We struggle in life when a difficulty comes and we say, Oh God, if you really loved me, why would you let this happen in my life? People say that all the time, (laughs) right? But look at this. Does Jesus promise that life will be trouble-free? He says, he guarantees it. He says, in this world, you will have trouble. I guarantee it. He says, oh, but in me, you're going to find peace in the midst of all the difficulties, in the midst of all the struggle. I will be there and guard your hearts and minds. Hmm. So don't go there. When, when the devil will tempt you and you've got a, a, a struggle in your life and you're tempted to get, say, why, God? That's not loving. If you really love me, why would you let this happen to me? Don't, don't go there. Okay? Because he guaranteed you're going to have problems, but he guaranteed he'd be with you in the midst of the problems. right? Because he says, take heart, I have overcome the world. Because Jesus overcame every temptation. You understand, if we think we're tempted by the devil, Jesus was tempted a bazillion times more. He was tempted in everything we could possibly imagine. Powerfully, the devil was always tempting him, and he overcame everything. Perfection. Never did he sin. So you and I, in the midst of our struggles and pain and temptations, 
if we cling to Jesus, we also will overcome all that the world throws at us. Hmm. And we can live in peace, even in the very terrible situations that life can bring sometimes. So peace is not about our circumstances. Peace is about the person of Jesus and trusting in him. Now let's talk about different types of peace that are found in Christ. Okay, Different types of peace that we find. Let's go over to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. And we'll have another passage in Romans as well. Romans chapter 5. This is the peace that is the main reason that Jesus came. The main reason he's the Prince of Peace. And all types of peace in Christ flow out of this one thing we're going to talk about. Okay, So Romans chapter 5, verse 1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. One more time. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so the reason that Jesus came to bring us peace was to give us peace with God through the sacrifice of himself. Hmm. Now, it mentions this word being justified. They used to throw me off for years and years. I was a younger person. I'm like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> it's a wonderful Bible word that you got to know. Justification or to be justified means to be declared innocent. Means to be declared righteous. Okay, that's really when we're forgiven of all our sins is when we're justified. Okay, so you could put in place, if you like, forgiveness, really. That the day you're forgiven is the day you're justified. Hmm. And that happens through faith in Jesus. That's amazing. We're declared innocent and, forgive, and forgiven of our sins when we were not innocent. And we were not worthy of this, but by his grace, when we put our faith in Jesus, our sins are forgiven, and then we have peace with God through Jesus that means the war is over. Hmm. Because if we're not at peace with God, that means the Bible tells us that we're at war with God. Hmm. Maybe you can think back to those days when you used to be at war with God. Maybe you're at war with God today. Hmm. But the blood of Jesus shed for us at the cross brings peace between us and God, because Jesus died for our sin, he paid the price that our sins deserve. Hmm. Some people don't think they're an enemy of God. Some people might say, well, I don't hate God. Right? I think God's all right. I don't think I hate him. <laughs> and you say, yes, but uh, are you trusting in the son Jesus who bled and died on the cross for your sins? Well, no, I don't believe in that Jesus guy. But I don't hate God. Oh, see, they don't understand. Because if we reject Jesus, the very Son of God whom he sent to do such a thing for us, is like spitting in the face of God. God is like, I love you so much, I'm going to send my Son to deal with your issue of sin, and he will die a sacrificial death horribly for your sins. But then you just say, I don't want him. The Bible says you're trampling him underfoot. You're stomping on Jesus and saying, you're worthless, you're refuse to me, I don't want you in my life, therefore I spit in your face, God. See, we're an enemy of God if we're not trusting in Jesus. And we really are. Whether we understand that or not, that is the case. And even people who don't even have even heard of Jesus yet, they're still an enemy of God because they haven't even sought God. Because if they did, then he would bring them to Jesus. So go over a little further in Romans 5, go to verse 9. Romans 5, 9, since... We have now been justified by his blood, right? Forgiven because of the blood of Jesus. How much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if when we were God's enemies, there it is, we were his enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Mm -hmm. Blessed be Jesus. Right. So we're saved not just through the death of Jesus, but also his life, his resurrection from the dead. You have to trust and believe in both of those things. So we were God's enemies. We were underneath God's wrath, going to hell, and Jesus came along and gave himself for us. And then when we put our faith in Jesus, I, I love this. This is so amazing. He transforms us from an enemy 
into a child of God. I just think that's so marvelous. Who would do such a thing? First, or John 1, 12. To all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So God sees us as his enemies, and he says, like, oh, well, let me give you my son. And then when we say yes to Jesus, he says, now stop being my enemy and come into my home. And let me love you. Let me provide for you. And come and spend eternity with me. And I will bless your socks off forever and ever and ever. (laughs) God takes us from an enemy and turns us into a beloved child. Mm, You don't get that anywhere else, right? Where are you going to get that? (laughs) Only in Jesus. Only in Jesus. Isaiah 53, 5. Let me read a passage to you from there. That's that great passage of Jesus' suffering predicted 700 years before the birth of Jesus. Isaiah chapter 53. Write that, write that down for your notes if you're not familiar with that and spend some time reading it. It's all about the crazy suffering of the cross. Isaiah 53, 5. It says, He, Jesus, He was pierced for our transgressions, which are sins. He was crushed for our iniquities, and the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. The punishment that brings you and I peace with God was put upon Jesus. It wasn't put upon us, but it was put upon Christ, and now we can have peace because he was exchanging his perfect life for our wretched life. He took our punishment, and we take peace. What an exchange! Who would not want that? Is there anybody today here that's living at war with God? And you haven't been trusting in Jesus? You've been living in sin? Well, remember that day, the door of God's grace is open. So maybe it's time to get it right. Maybe it's time to forsake your sin and really bow yourself under the lordship of Jesus. Hmm. So peace with God. Hmm. From that peace that Jesus brings, all other forms of peace come about. So the next peace I want to discuss, I would call it maybe daily peace. You could call it inner peace if you like inner peace or daily peace, peace for daily living, because though we're saved and forgiven of our sin, we got peace with God, there's still like craziness down here, right? In our hearts and minds and all the turmoil of of life and situations. But Jesus also promises us daily peace with him. Mm, Thank you, Lord. Let me read to you Isaiah 26. Isaiah 26, I've got this one highlighted in my Bible, definitely. Write that one down. If you can turn there, check it out. But Isaiah 26, 3. Isaiah 26, 3. He says, You will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you. That God will keep us in perfect peace if our minds are steadfast upon Christ, trusting in Him. Mm, What a passage. And we find this to be so true, that the more your mind, everything happens in the mind. Have you noticed that? Everything happens in the mind. Sin takes place here before it ever goes out in the body, right? Everything takes place in the mind. Love for God takes place here before it ever is expressed in any other way. So if our minds are fixed Upon Jesus, trusting in him, we'll find a greater peace in our life. But the less we are steadfast upon Jesus in the mind, the less we will trust him, and therefore the peace will be less and less. So you want greater peace? You have to have a greater steadfastness in the mind upon Jesus. That's how it works. I don't know about you, But I have not always had perfect peace in this life. (laughs) Maybe you have. (laughs) I bet you haven't. Amidst life's difficulties and trials, sometimes I have tremendous and overwhelming peace. Oh, 
that passes all understanding. It's gorgeous. And then there's other times, frankly, I don't. (laughs) And I'm worried and stressed. How often have we awoken in the night at two in the morning and we can't shut the brain off? And we're thinking about all the issues and the struggles and the, the, you know, the things going on and the stress. And yet we as believers, we know. We know in our heart Jesus loves us. We know he will not leave us nor forsake us. We know this intellectually, but sometimes there's a gap between knowing these things and experiencing that peace in daily moments and situations. Hmm. So we battle with anxiety and stress sometimes. But it really comes down to the fact that the mind is not steadfast upon Jesus, trusting in him as we should. Hmm. So, how was your peace this morning? You say, well, my peace is pretty good, or maybe my peace is not good. (laughs) That's okay. You know what? As we spoke about last week, remember, joy is one of the fruits of the Spirit. So is peace. Hmm. Galatians 5.22, the fruits of the Spirit are love, Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Third on the list is peace. Hmm. And just like when you go to the apple tree in the backyard and you see the stick and the leaves, you don't come out in the next day and be like, Psh, it's full of apples, right? You don't. <laughs> you see a bloom and a bud and it grows and it grows and you're like, it's coming, it's getting better, it's maturing, it's growing, and now I can harvest. The same with the fruits of the Spirit. So if you're struggling with peace this morning, you know what? We're all on this growth. We're all heading towards greater maturity, hopefully. (laughs) We're heading towards greater maturity in Christ. And though you may not have all the peace in perfect measure right now, if you keep pressing into Jesus and your mind is more and more steadfast upon the Lord, your peace will grow. Your peace will grow. It will. And you'll look back and go, wow, five years ago, if I had experienced this, I'd have been all freaked out. But this, this time I got so much more peace, right? And maybe you can look back and see the progression of the growth of the fruit of the Spirit in your life. Hmm. Now, sometimes people stagnate. Sometimes people backslide and they're not growing in, their, in the fruit of the Spirit. So let's press on into Jesus, right? And then more and more peace will come. And also we learned last week, remember Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. And if you remain in me, you'll produce good fruit. So closeness to Jesus is always the answer. But we find that sometimes God will stimulate the branches of our life so we'll produce greater fruit. Remember, we learned that the father is the the, the gardener and he prunes our lives. Hmm. And how does he do that? Well, sometimes the pruning shear is adversity, is struggle, it is difficulty. (laughs) We don't like that, but that's the father pruning us. Just think, if your life was always perfect and nothing ever went wrong, it was all easy, 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 cheesy all the time, would you grow in the fruits of the Spirit? (laughs) You wouldn't. You'd think, well, yes, I would. No, you would. But when your life is now in turmoil, when your life is now in these turbulent situations and they're difficult, then it's a test. Then it's an opportunity as God is stripping away the the comfort of your life, to say, now I'm going to trust in Jesus in the midst of the pain, in the midst of the trouble. I'm going to cling to the Prince of Peace. Hmm. It's a test. It's a test. So look at the trials and the tribulations as tests. Do you remember on the radio and the TV used to go, this is a test, only a test of the emergency broadcasting system. Remember that? Do they still do that? Okay, I just haven't seen it in years. I thought they stopped that. <laughs> so when the trial and the difficulty comes into your life, instead of complaining and moaning, hear, this is a test. <laughs> God is preparing you. He's wanting to grow the fruit of your spirit, the spirit in your life. And if you cling to the Prince of Peace, then you can learn to have peace in the midst of the struggle and the strain. And you will be a testimony to the world of what God is doing in your life. Hmm. And all comes down to trust anyway, right? All comes down to trust. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your... Hmm. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your path. Trusting in Jesus is how we fix our minds upon Him. 
And when the difficult times come, we say, wait, no, I'm trusting. I'm starting to get all frazzled. Wait, wait, I'm trusting in Jesus. He's going to take care of me. And then peace can be there for us to live in. And I can never talk about peace, daily peace, without bringing up Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, maybe you know it. I taught, uh, taught it to my children at home. They memorized it. Uh, the youth group kids, we were working on memorizing that. Also, uh, a youth group or two. And I encourage you to memorize this. It is a magnificent passage that I personally have clung to on so many occasions and will continue to do so throughout my life. It brings me peace. Because this is the path to that peace in this moment of struggle and strain. Let's, uh, Philippians 4, six. Philippians 4.6 Do not be anxious about anything but in everything by prayer and petition. With thanksgiving, present your requests to God. So when you read that, don't be anxious about anything. Well, I can't do that. The stress is coming. So what do you do with it? Oh, but in everything by prayer and petition, give it to Jesus. Learn in your life to give your stress to Jesus. Right? That means go in your room, close the door, get on your knees, and cry out to Christ. Jeremiah would pour out his heart like water, the Bible says. He just let God have everything that he was concerned about. Right? Just give it, give it, give it to Jesus. Weep, cry, wail, yell out loud, do whatever you got to do. Give it to Jesus. And then it says, with thanksgiving, present those requests. So don't just cry and give it to him. Give it to him and say, but Jesus, I trust you. Right? I thank you. You're, you're awesome. I know you're going to get me through this. So I thank you for what you're going to do in the future. In verse 7, in the peace of God, there it is. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And brothers and sisters, I can testify, and many of you can as well, that when you have done this, you have received the supernatural peace from heaven that has guarded your mind and your heart through very difficult situations. Through Jennifer and I, just he guarded us through death and through anguish when we could have unraveled. And we felt his peace sustaining us. Thank you, Jesus. And many of you have experienced this. But we keep going back to this, okay? Keep going back and let his peace guard you. Notice it says it it transcends all understanding. The world is not going to understand when they see a Christian at peace. Hmm. What did King David say? Psalm 23, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me, right? So David understood it way back then, looking forward to Jesus, but now we know him. Remember last week I mentioned the the Christian, that man who had the brain cancer? He's in the hospital, he's in the oncology ward, and the nurse was so concerned about this Christian who had brain cancer for crying out loud. You know, this is a horrible, horrible condition. So she went to his chart and she wrote in his chart a special note because she wanted the doctor to see it because this was just not right. She wrote down, patient Mr. So-and-so is inappropriately joyful. (laughs) And she couldn't understand. She had no capacity to understand why on earth this man with brain cancer would be so full of joy as he lay there dying in the hospital bed. But that was the fruit of the Spirit manifesting in this man's life. No doubt he also was inappropriately peaceful. Third on the list, right after joy. (laughs) So even in the difficult times, we can have a joy that the world will look at and say, that doesn't make any sense. It surpasses all understanding, and that joy and that peace will be guarding our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Inappropriately peaceful. Let me tell you a story of a man in the Scripture coming out of Acts chapter 6 and 7, if you'd like to turn there. Acts 6 and 7, you might remember the very first martyr of the church. The very first man to give his life for the sake of Jesus. A man, a wonderful man named Stephen. You remember Stephen? He was a mighty man. Oh, to have a church full of Stephens. (laughs) <laughs> Make us like Stephen, Lord. This guy, he so loved God, he so knew the Scriptures, and he began to talk with these men who began to argue with him about Jesus and about God. And pretty soon it got very heated, and they grabbed him, and they dragged him into court, and they brought him before the Sanhedrin. This is Acts chapter 6. 
And they brought him before the Sanhedrin, and that is the Jewish ruling council of 70 men, and they're the ones who sent Jesus and condemned him and brought him to Pilate that he might be crucified. So there's Stephen, right? This guy who loves God, he's filled with the Holy Spirit right at the beginning of the church. And he brings him in, and he's standing for 70 guys, and they put him on trial, and they start bringing false witnesses in. People that they know are lying on purpose about this man. And they're saying things about him that would ultimately be a death sentence. Okay? These people could kill him if he's found guilty. So there they are. False witnesses are coming, and they're lying and lying. And just think, if you're in court, and you're innocent, and how your heart would sink when people, this guy stands up and says, oh, he did this and that, and I heard him say that, and this guy says it. And all these false witnesses, and you're thinking, I'm going to die. I don't see any way out of this. This is horrible. It would be a place where you might not have a lot of peace. Let me read to you verse 15, Acts 6, 15. This is the response, and this is what's going on in the heart of Stephen in the midst of this moment. Verse 15, it says, Okay, so they, they all gave false testimony, and then they turned to him and looked at him, and he was going to get a chance to defend himself. This is what he says, verse 15. All who were, I'm sorry, this is what he was doing in verse 15. <clears throat> All who were sitting at the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. <laughs> I love it. They look at Stephen. There he is. He should be petrified. He should be shaking in his little sandals. He should be going, oh, I'm going to die here. And they look at him intently, and there he is, like the face of an angel, right? sitting there. <laughs> I don't know what an fa angel's face looks like. I've never seen it. But I think that what's implying here is this is a man who had perfect peace because his, his mind was steadfast upon Jesus, trusting in him, Isaiah 26. So there he was, just looking like an angel. Just, he, he does, he's not even bothered <laughs> by the circumstances. He was inappropriately peaceful. And then they gave him the floor. And like all of chapter 7, it's a magnificent passage. He, he basically preaches this awesome sermon to them. He gives a history lesson from Abraham all the way up to Moses who predicted Jesus and up to Christ. And they all listen to him. And then he pulls no punches and he lets them know, because they're the ones who condemned Jesus, remember? And he lets them know that they murdered the Savior. He tells them straight out, you killed him. You murdered the Messiah. And of course, this didn't go well with these guys. He's very peaceful when he does it, but they come out of their skin. Verse 54 of chapter 7. Verse 54 of chapter 7. When they heard this, they were furious, and they gnashed their teeth at him. They're literally going, ah, like, oh, they just want him to die. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, inappropriately joyful, you could put in a little margin there, and peaceful, he looked up to heaven and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. God gives him a vision. He is so full of peace. His mind is so fixed upon Jesus. God gives him a vision of heaven and God in Christ. And he goes, look, as if everybody else could see it. Look, he said, I see heaven open. And the Son of Man, who is Jesus, standing at the right hand of God. <laughs> and he's just glowing like an angel right there in their presence. Verse 57 at this, they covered their ears, and they yelled at the top of their voice. They can't even hear what he's saying. They don't want to hear one word about Jesus in heaven next to the Father. They literally cover their ears, 70 men covering and screaming at the top of their voices in anger. They're coming unglued, and they all rush at him. In the 858, they drag him out of the city, grab him by his clothes. They're hauling him, all these men, out of the city, dragging him through the dirt, and they began to stone him. That means they would pick up the rocks on the side of the road and hurl them at him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. I'll keep reading the book of Acts. You'll find he turns into a magnificent man. He's approving of Stephen's death. Later, he becomes one of the greatest Christians to walk the earth. Verse 59, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep, which is the Bible nice way of saying he died. They killed him. They were hurling big rocks and little rocks at him, and there he is getting pummeled. Bam, hit him in the head. He's bleeding. He's starting to go down. He falls down to his knees. He says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He knows I'll be with you, Lord, in a moment. 
but he's full of peace. And what does he do, full of peace? He forgives these guys. Lord, do not hold the sin against them. Bam, bam, bam. He's dead right there. Right? He forgave the men who are so wretched to him. Do you remember Jesus on the cross? What did he say? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. That'll help you and I forgive other people when we quote that very same thing, right? It helps us to understand that person who's being nasty to me, they don't know if they really knew Jesus. They wouldn't do that. Father, forgive them. So Stephen is seeing just like Jesus here, and he's asking for the Father to forgive. So what a story of inappropriately peaceful (laughs) response to such hatred and anger. Oh, Jesus, make us like Stephen, we pray. Mm, Give us such a peace that will pass all understanding. Hmm. Let me tell you another story of a man I read about this week, a man named John Bradford. John Bradford. This was in the 1500s. During the Reformation, after Martin Luther uh, began to break away from the Catholic Church and break away from the bondage of, of their, their uh, bad teaching that the church had been held captive for so, so long. And these early reformers really had to struggle because the Catholic Church often was trying to kill them. They labeled them as heretics, and they would kill them and burn them at the stake or drown them or whatever the thing was. They would do nasty things to them because they said that, you know, you're not doing it right, uh, even though they were doing it all right. So John Bradford was arrested. Do you remember King Henry VIII? A little history lesson. Some of you remember him. He's one of the famous kings who had those six wives, and he liked to chop their heads off and stuff. <laughs> he was trying to get a male heir, and he couldn't seem to figure it out for a while. And, and uh, sometimes he'd chop their heads off. Sometimes he'd divorce them. Well, his first wife, Catherine, he, couldn't see, he, got, he got a girl. Her name was Mary. She's very important to the story in just a moment. But he couldn't get a boy, so which actually the men determine the sex of the child, but he didn't know that, so this wife can't give me a boy. So he wanted to divorce his wife. But the Catholic Church said, no, you can't divorce. So he just said, well, I'll do what I want. So he decided to break away from the Catholic Church, and he broke away, and King Henry became the head of the church, and it was called the Church of England. It's still there today. Right? So that was this great sever uh, between Catholicism and then you know King Henry doing what he wants, so then he could remarry Anne, Bo- Anne Boleyn and the rest of his wives after that. Uh, Henry died. His son, Edward, he finally had a son. Edward took the throne. He was there for a while. He must have been fairly good to the Protestants as the Protestant church was growing. We're Protestants, by the way. But then he died. And you know who took the throne? Henry's first daughter, Mary, whom he divorced his mother, her mother, Catherine. They were staunch Catholics. England at that time was going back and forth from being Protestant to being Catholic. She passionately wanted to bring England back to Catholicism. So she, she got a nickname. Her nickname was Bloody Mary. Maybe you've heard of her. Other things have been named after her <laughs> throughout the years. But Bloody Mary. And the reason why her name was Bloody Mary is because she killed so many Protestants. She was trying to rid England of Protestantism. Anybody who disagreed with the Catholic Church, she would murder them with the Catholic Church's approval. They, they killed all kinds of people they called heretics. So Bloody Mary arrested John Bradford and put him in prison. She called him a heretic. She wanted him to recant his faith, but he believed in the New Testament because he got to read it, and he rejected Catholicism and said, no, that's not right. So there he was. In prison, let me read part of his story. It says, The very next day, John was sentenced to death. And the keeper's wife, the prison keeper's wife, came to him with the news, Tomorrow you will be burned. They would burn people at the stake. Um, He was so popular in prison, he preached two services a day from his prison cell. People, crowds would come to the prison. And he would do two services every day preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ from prison. And the innkeeper, I think, really cared for him. So the innkeeper's wife, she comes and lets him know that tomorrow you're going to be burned. You're going to die. And Bradford looked to heaven and said, I thank God for it. I have waited for this for a long time. Lord, make me worthy of this. 
Hoping to keep the crowds from knowing what was going on, the guards transferred him to another prison in the middle of the night. But somehow, word got out, and a great multitude came to bid him farewell. Okay, These are all the people who listened to his sermons twice a day. Many wept openly as they prayed for him. Bradford, in return, gently f- said farewell and prayed fervently for them and their future. At four o'clock the next morning, a large crowd gathered at the place where Bradford was to be burned. Finally, at nine o'clock, an unusually large number of heavily, heavily armed men brought Bradford out to the stake. With him was John Leaf, a teenager who also refused to deny his faith. Both men, were, uh, both men fell flat to the ground and prayed for an hour. Bradford got up, kissed a piece of firewood, and kissed the stake that he would be burned upon. And in a loud voice, he spoke to the crowd, England, repent of your sins. Beware of idolatry. Beware of false teachers. See that they do not deceive you. Speaking of Roman Catholicism. Then he forgave his persecutors. Like Stephen, like Jesus. He forgave them publicly, and he asked the crowd to pray for him. Turning his head towards John Leaf, he said, Be of good comfort, brother, for we shall have a merry supper with the Lord tonight. We're going to have a merry supper with Jesus tonight. And they were burned at the stake. He was inappropriately peaceful in the midst of his execution. There are some notes about him that I read in other places that John Bradford had been described as one of the holiest men since the apostles. Whoa, what a, what a thing to say. And among the greatest and most spiritual of the reformers. Fox, in his book of martyrs, said, These two lambs, they both ended their mortal lives being void of all fear. Hmm. Perfect peace. You and I may or may not face such a fate, but when I read about the martyrs, I am filled with strength. And I want to be like them. But if they can do that in those situations, can we not do it at work, and at home, in a school, living at peace, inward peace, trusting in Jesus, right? For your finances, for all the things, for your kids. For relationships, can we not live at peace? Hmm. It's available. We just have to cling to Christ. Now, briefly, the last few things. What are some hindrances? What are some hindrances to peace? Well, the mind not being steadfast, as we talked about, right? That hinders. So when we start not being focused on Jesus, it will hinder our peace. And of course, sin. Right? Sin will always hinder everything. <laughs> it hinders everything. Relationships with one another, relationship with God. Just think, if you have unforgiveness in your life, will you have peace? Right? Because when you're not forgiving someone, you get bitterness in your heart. The Bible calls it a root of bitterness. I picture this big root like a carrot root in my mind. That's what I think of. Growing down into my heart. These little veins coming out. This root of bitterness. And if you have a bitterness in your heart and you're unforgiving towards someone, then you will not have a heart at peace. Will you? But when you forgive and you let that go and you give that burden to Jesus and you let God deal with that individual, then peace can come. What about envy? Boy, envy rots your bones. If you're envious, oh, I wish I could be like that person. How come that person has more than me? How come that person's more successful than me? You're not going to be at peace. So all these, you could go on and on with different types of sins, but they're going to wreck your peace. Now briefly, what about peace with other people? Peace with other people. Well, the short of it is, (laughs) we live in a crazy, broken Sinful world. Hmm. And it's hard to have peace with other people. Let me read to you Romans 12, 18. 12, 18, it says, If it is possible, note that, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. 
Hmm. I heard Emma memorizing this passage the other day for one of her Bible classes. <laughs> if it's possible. As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everybody. That means we as Christians do our very best to try to live at peace with the people who are nasty and mean to us, right? <laughs> but notice it says, if it is possible. Frankly, sometimes it's not possible. Some people will never live at peace with us, no matter how much peace we try to offer them. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. So we do our best, but some people, they won't have it. So we still forgive, we still love, but it's a struggle sometimes in this life. But you know... We can have peace inwardly, we have peace with God, but then one day we will step into eternity and then we will know eternal peace. Days without end. Let me read to you Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11, eternal peace. And before I get there, just one note too. So we may struggle with people in this world, but how about the church though? Of all places, that ought to be the place where we get along with each other. Right? <laughs> Do we all the time? Nah, not all the time, because we're kind of dumb. We struggle. But Jesus did command us to love one another. So let's do our very best, particularly in the church, to have peace with each other. Yeah. All right, so Isaiah chapter 11. This is talking about the millennial kingdom. One day there will be peace on earth. All those bumper stickers will finally come true, but it'll just come through in a different way. <laughs> Not through flowers in your hair and songs you're singing, but through the return of Jesus Christ. We're talking about this first advent when Jesus comes to save us. The second advent, he comes to judge and rule and reign over the entire earth, and his peace will surround and swallow the earth. Oh, it's going to be magnificent. He will put down all rebellion, and here's a picture of such extreme peace on the earth that has only been known at the very beginning of creation. I read you to Isaiah 11, verse 6. Isaiah 11, verse 6. The wolf will live with the lamb. Do you know wolves don't live with lambs today? Unless they're lamb chops, right? The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together and a little child We'll lead them, and I love it. We don't let our little children play with lions, right? My brother lives in Africa. He's heard lions roar from outside his house, and he's ran outside to see the lion. I said, shouldn't you stay inside? But in that day, sure, children, go out and play with the lions. It's all right. <laughs> little kids will drag them around like pets. Verse 7, and the cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. God will actually change the predators and make them into vegetarians, no longer carnivores. The infant will play near the hole of the cobra, and the young child will put its young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. We don't let our kids play with snakes, vipers. We don't do that. But in that day, it's all right. They're not going to bother you. They will neither harm nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Hmm. Do the waters cover the sea? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that will be the envelopment of the peace of Christ. We'll actually rule and reign over the entire world. Peace will cover all mankind, even down to animal kind. It won't just be us getting along, but it'll actually be even the animals getting along. Do you know there's no peace in the animal kingdom today? Right? I remember Marty Stelfer's Wild America and all. They're just killing each other. That's all they ever do is breed and kill each other. Right? That's it. Animals bite and they rip and they shred. And humans bite and they rip and they shred. Because there's death and there's sin and there's rebellion against God. But one day when Jesus is king... The animals will no longer be at war, nor the people. Hmm. What a gorgeous time that will be. In fact, the earth, what's happening here, it's really reverting back to a Garden of Eden-like state. Because that's how it was in the Garden of Eden. No death. Everybody got along. So Christ's peace will come one day and rule over everything. That'll be for the thousand years, okay? After a thousand years, the devil will be released because he's held captive in the abyss for those years. There'll be a small rebellion and then a new heaven and a new earth. 
that passage in Isaiah 9 that was read this morning. It says that the government will be upon his shoulders. That's the government on the earth. He will make all the rules. He will be king. And there will be peace. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. In the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. And he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So where are you today and what has God the Holy Spirit said to you through his word? Are you living in peace with God through Jesus? Are there things that are hindering your peace? Are you full of anxiety and stress? Do you need to give those things to Christ?